Shalom, shalom everybody and good morning. I'm so glad to be here with you today and have Jacob Shoshan with us, of course, as always. If you don't know uh, Jacob yet, um, Jacob Shoshan is Jerusalem born and is a licensed tour guide in Israel, as well as a teacher and lecturer at the tour, uh, the tour guide college in Israel. Shoshan has visited 98 countries and led tours in 60, uh, five countries and all six continents. How incredible is that? Um, Jacob is fluent in 15 languages and he presents in-depth discussions on Jewish history, philosophy and culture and is deeply involved in Holocaust education. Today he's going to take us through Japan, the oddities and the Jewish stories. And we are thrilled to have Jacob here with us today and happy to go to a life-changing trip in Israel with Jacob where he's going to guide us on foot in Israel, and we are couldn't be more happy than, than go this fall. Uh, Jacob, I will appreciate if you'll say a few words about the trip that we're having together. Sure. Shalom, everybody, and welcome on board. Finally, after two long, excruciating years, finally we can travel. And now I started the uh, traveling with people and visiting here in person after all these Zoom calls which were great for themselves, but now it's time to really feel and sense and smell and taste and interact and kiss and hug and whatever while in Israel. So we are gonna run a really, really nice tour. Many of you must have seen it already. The itinerary, if not, please let Adi know and she will direct the, the itinerary to you. She will forward it to you. It will be really special two weeks. We figured some people haven't been in a long time or some people have never been at all. And even people who were recently, there are all the time so many new things that are happening. So we've tried to include and probably will even update it with even more up-to-date items that we'd like to visit, really special places. So we'd like to welcome you to travel with us. We have selected nice hotels. You can see that what I carry on me, that does not come from air. So <laughs> I've been eating my way through and I'd love to share with you some of my favorite places and we'd love to have you with us. So please consider it, give it a thought and think positively about it. Wonderful, thank you, Jacob. I have put in the chat for you um, the the our website for more information and also I included my email address if you have any questions for me or want to know about the registration please feel free to email me and now Jacob you can go ahead and start to talk about Japan all right I'll start sharing with you the story of uh, Japan uh, please motion to me if you can see the opening slide excellent so you see how I called it, beauty, oddities, and surprising Jewish stories. This is not meant to be instead of the many beautiful, I don't know, Discovery Channel or National Geographic movies or all kinds of special TV programs. And many of you must have visited Japan by now. This is just to highlight what I find fascinating in that country and to add a special Jewish story, a place we don't necessarily associate. Japan is not a place we necessarily associate with uh, Jews and Israel, but hey, surprise. So we'll take the long flight either directly from the East Coast or from the West Coast, whatever it is that you might be flying from. And let's start at the Narita International Airport, which is right uh, outside of Tokyo. And you know by now the map of Japan, it's an island nation right off the shores of Asia in the Pacific Ocean. I think everybody knows it. What I'd like to do is to take you on a trip that will connect us from Tokyo by way of some interesting sites, which I deem very interesting and important, especially for the Jewish story, on our way to Kyoto. Of course, there is so much more to visit. I didn't take you to Hiroshima, and to uh, Kanazawa and many other beautiful, beautiful sites, but we have a little time to discover this country. Actually, Japan can and should be visited year round, but there are two main seasons, which I suggest 
you consider when traveling to Japan. One of them is coming up in the fall, sometime in October, because the fall foliage is absolutely stunning. Not only do they have this incredible sense of landscaping and they create marvelous gardens, they already take into consideration when planting the young trees, how will it look like during fall foliage? And it's really stunning. Or how will everything look like in the spring during the cherry blossom? They have a special word for it, sakura, and combined with their unique architecture, with their amazing landscape, especially in the vicinity of Tokyo, from many locations, one can see this perfect conic shape of Mount Fuji, which is definitely, definitely a, an attraction, definitely a highlight. So that with the blossom makes it really, really special. But even in the city, they have many city parks, and those city parks with the brooks and the lakes and the ponds and the reflection of this amazing blossom really makes it worthwhile. In addition to calling the cherry, the cherry, the cherry blossom, they call it sakura, they have hanami, which is a special kind of holiday they celebrate within that short season. And that's when they leave a little earlier. Usually the Japanese will really stay at work as long as it takes, but during that period, very few days, uh, they will actually leave the office early. The city has provided them with these big mats or sheets or tatamis or whatever, and they'll go to the grocery store or the supermarket and get some uh, food and drinks and they'll sit and celebrate. And it's a very, very festive moment, definitely an attraction to see when you are visiting there. While you visit Tokyo, of course, everybody will go and see the amazing Imperial Palace. We cannot go in, but we see it from the outside. We will go, however, into many of the beautiful temples that they have in the city. We'll take the elevator to the top of some of the skyscrapers in this very, very modern city at the same time to look at Mount Fuji and the skyline of the city. Until a few years ago, I'm just, just a few decades ago, they didn't really have high buildings because this area, as you know, is very active, tectonic uh, movements, uh, and they were not sure, but then they found ways to build these huge buildings and that has changed the city completely, offering us some magnificent, very, very interesting skyline with the buildings all over the place. Going back to street level, uh, we have some very, very colorful, while we have these stern, gray, glass, and metal office buildings, we have these colorful neighborhoods, and some of them are so beautifully illuminated at night, you are not sure whether it's night or day, with the lights, with the sounds, with the busy, busy streets, everything against very modern, very convenient and efficient a transportation systems that really get you in no time from one side of the city to the other. And on the way you stop and marvel at some of their amazing creation with sound and light. Their train stations are very, very special. That's one of the many uh, train stations in Tokyo, but wait till we get to the one in Kyoto, something that I must admit, I cannot get over it, but we'll see it later. Even things like excuse me for the graphic details, public facilities. Uh, you come there and you say, I cannot go there. The walls are transparent, not just translucent. But once you go inside and you latch the lock, uh, it becomes opaque and then you can use them quietly. The reason I show it to you is not for the toilet, excuse me, but for this amazing, amazing innovation. Look at the baby seat. I'm sure many of us had some issues going to the bathrooms with the babies in hand. What do you do with the baby? Look at this convenient solution. You just put them there. They're still with you. You see them, they see you. But one is comfortable and that's it. I will not dwell much more on the topic. I just thought that that is an incredible invention. I wish they would have it in more places. I also wish more cities will forbid completely smoking in the outdoor, on the main streets, on the narrow streets, you want to smoke, 
you have to walk a few hundred yards and every now and then they've allocated the smoking area away from the people. Nobody should have to breathe, right? And to inhale whatever some people have exhaled. And I hope I'm not offending any smokers, but uh, on behalf of the non-smokers, I think that this is a wonderful, wonderful way. They have lots and lots of marketplaces, obviously, like in many places, but their fish market is something most unusual, surrounded by lots of eateries that offer from early morning all kinds of interesting dishes, from sushi and sashimi to all kinds of other stuff. Talking about sushi and sashimi, imagine this is how much money this fish was auctioned. Can you imagine anybody paying this kind of money for a fish, and they auction it every morning. I'll show you how they go and they display and people come and take, they have like special tweezers. They pinch a tiny little piece of the fish from the rear part, they taste it, oh my goodness. They freak out and immediately the restaurant owner lets uh, some of his most avid customers know and they will come and pay fortune for a certain part, a small piece or more than a small piece of that amazing fish. The fish market is such an important uh, thing that they moved it from downtown into a new area out of the city center. And this is where they put all the fish on uh, display and people will pass around, chefs, restaurant owners, hotel pur purveyors and whatever, and they'll place a bid. Between all that, lots of action, both in the temples and in the modern part of the city, where you will see some unbelievable, modern, creative, innovative architecture that is really, really special. And even simple places, for example, can you imagine this is the backyard of a McDonald's eatery? Look how beautiful and how pleasant it is, surrounded by the trees and Everything, needless to say, is sparkling, absolutely clean. The whole country is absolutely amazing. This is something you must have seen in pictures, some of the famous uh, uh, crossing, the pedestrian crossing, especially this Shibuya, where tens of thousands of people every hour, sometimes hundreds of thousands over the day, when the lights change, they let the pedestrian traffic cross in every conceivable direction all at once. And this is a sight to be seen, both from the ground or I like to take my friends, the people I traveled with, up to a few floors and one of the office buildings higher and uh, look at it from above. It's absolutely amazing, really, really special. The Shibuya crossing. Of course, now we can go and see where things happen, whether in the office section or this Takeshita street, this is meant to see and to be seen. Lots of young people, but not only. It's not strictly reserved. Very interesting freak shopping, all kind of offbeat. And look at the way these young people dress up. Guys, this is not Halloween. This is not Purim for those of you who celebrate Purim. This is how these people dress up and show, and not only in the street. The young people, especially the young ladies, love to walk around in this amazing outfit and they don't really need a reason to put it on. Look at that. At the same time, this picture shows us some uh, Chinese tourists who come to visit and some of the Chinese tour companies, the moment they land, they give them these kimonos. This is not exactly the traditional kimono. It looks very similar and it's absolutely beautiful and interesting. This can be worn and taken off in no time. The real kimono for the Japanese ladies can take up to an hour, up to an hour to wear it, to put it on. But you'll see many people wearing these colorful, beautiful kimonos in the street. In one of the shops, you will see a whole shop dedicated just to wrapping, gift wrapping materials from paper and ribbons and all kinds of interesting items to wrap your gift. Even the ice cream doesn't just leave the ice cream stand. They will make sure to beautifully decorate it. Look at the work they do on the coffee, like we have also back, of course, in the States, lots of the coffee shops, but here 
they really go an extra mile. The latest thing for the last few years and increasing is the crepe. They will fill it with all kinds of fruits and jams and jellies and uh, whipped cream and chocolate and whatever, creating really, really masterpieces out of the crepe. Now we are a little tired and we'd like to sit down in a coffee shop. We can choose from regular, ordinary coffee shop or we can go to a coffee shop where we are going to enjoy our tea or coffee with porcupines. How about that? Cuddling porcupines sit on your lap and on your table right next to you. Or we can go to a nearby place where we have many cats all over us, friendly, they cuddle, they like to be touched, they like to be caressed and petted. So this is a coffee shop with cats. Now, if you wanna go really strange, how about a coffee shop with owls? How about you sit and touch the owls and they're all over you and next to you? Or for the daring one, how about a coffee shop that has snakes that are all over you and they are as friendly as can be, of course, not dangerous. So far, so good. But now this is a real oddity. This is Japan. People love pets. Many people love pets. But some of them with their crazy lifestyle cannot afford. It's not fair for the pet to be indoor all day long. They start early in the morning. They come back at night. But they like to have a pet. So they buy a toy pet. But the toy pet is bored. So every now and then they take the toy pet to a coffee shop where it can play with other toy pets. So this is a coffee shop where you bring your toy to play with other toys. And we're talking about real serious grown-up people. Some of them are fascinating business people. They can be scientists. They could be lawyers and judges and whatever, but that's their thing. You go to another coffee shop where the waitresses will be dressed as chambermaids or cleaning ladies or They'll put on all kinds of outfits from your famous TV shows and whatever. And everything is so colorful and so festive in such a contrast to the very severe and stern and serious atmosphere lurking in the office buildings. You want to be a little while still? Let's take some karting. We can drive in the streets with these special cars. And before you go into the car, you can rent one of these outfits, you can be Superman or Batman or whatever, all kinds of interesting outfits to drive through the busy streets of Tokyo. Some of them are so busy, they have no time to date and they don't see themselves in any way getting married for the time being. So temporarily, they marry a virtual bride. She is with them at home, she is like a Siri in the sense that you talk to her and she answers, not only giving you the time and the temperature, but conduct real conversations with you. This guy, for example, uh, is very famous for showing off and showing himself with his bride. This is the person, the item he is married to, legally, legally married to, to a virtual bride, which is like a robot in this kind of canister. For dessert, you go and have a gazillion items. Most Western people have difficulties connected to them. It took me a while to learn to love some of them. They are mostly made out of all kinds of beans and they have a different texture and different feel to it. But no matter what, they are so aesthetically looking and the wrapping is so gorgeous. This is something that I find absolutely amazing. Uh, you take the six months old baby to the sumo wrestler farm. How do you scare babies? Six months, what's going to scare them? They look and they learn about the world. They try to make sense of what goes around them. So you put these scary masks on you, but then you put them into the hands of the sumo wrestler. The first baby who starts crying has just won the competition. He's going to be blessed. He's going to be lucky. It's like a special display of intelligence. He was scared looking at this humongous sumo wrestler. A new item in that department is sumo lady wrestler, something that did not exist and still is being met with lots of objection and criticism by some of the more traditional Japanese. 
But these ladies are here and they're here to stay. And of course, we salute them and wish them great victory and great luck. And we salute their achievements in trying to make society more accommodating and inclusive and what have you. During some other time, if you don't go to the sumo farm, you go to a crying therapy. You go to a special session because you had some issues and you cannot express yourself or you're a little tense. And some people believe that the best way to get out of this kind of stress, you go to a crying session where they will share with you stories. They'll show you short clips and movies and they will not relinquish until you actually cry. Another thing you do after you went crying is the boss encourages you to take a nap. I think that in our Western society, what do you mean you just caught a 25 minutes nap while you're on the job? I'm not paying you, says the boss, to take a sleep, to take a, a little uh, uh, time off. The Japanese encourage their employees. They realize that the 20, 25 minutes nap in the afternoon literally gives you a second wind. And I think many of you must have experienced it. You don't really need to go for an afternoon rest for two hours. You will go for 20 or half an hour, 20 minutes or half an hour, and they have a term for it, the inemuri. Look at this young lady's teeth. We spent fortune fortune, sending our kids to have their teeth straightened. This lady had perfectly straight teeth. She spent fortune to make them crooked like that. How about that? Well, she'll be fed up with it. She'll give up and she'll go back to the dentist and they'll fix her up again and she'll have beautiful teeth. But right now in this phase, in this stage in life, in this age, she thinks it's cute and it makes her special and unusual and she has her teeth turned this way. Talking about young people, I admire many things about the Japanese. One of the things I really admire the most, look, it's the school kids. After class is over, before going home, they'll clean their classroom. It shouldn't be that it will be only somebody else's job to clean and sweep after them. They all take turns and they participate. And I think this is to me a very shocking and very beautiful thing that the Japanese people do. I mentioned the very interesting architecture and talking about oddities, how about this cubicle shaped watermelon, which travels better, is can be uh, packed better and displayed better and carried better from the store. Most of it will not necessarily be eaten. Some of them will only be used for decoration. How about, guys, $200 for a watermelon? And they snatch them as soon as they come on the shelf. A very cheap item is the accommodation in these special hotels. They have these capsule hotels. There is a common bathroom and shower down the corridor, but everybody can climb up or down into their capsule make themselves absolutely comfortable, enjoy all the privacy in the world. There is Wi-Fi, there is telephone, uh, there is USB um, a charging port and whatever. And many of them, instead of schlepping now, traveling for an hour and a half uh, each way after a long day at work or went out with the boss and other colleagues from the office, and it's midnight, instead of now traveling for an hour and a half, as I said, and then make the word the way back, they'll go to a nearby capsule hotel while they're overnight. You don't see too many people buying tissues. It's corporations and companies and businesses along the street who come out and distribute free of charge these small tissue packs. This way, that's how they pay for their advertising because you're going to keep the, the tissue until you use it. Uh, it will take you a few hours or maybe more if you didn't use all of it in one day. And that is how they advertise themselves. It's so interesting. So, you know, at one point, somebody will offer you a pack of tissues. Other than that, you don't really go to many convenience stores because so much is being sold through the vending machines, from electronics to stationery to cold drinks, of course, and also hot drinks. 
you can get amazing coffee brewed and tea and uh, ch or chocolate, whatever, through the vending machines and they're all over the place. Look at the strange way they denote the hours. We would write 20, of course, military time is eight o'clock p.m. And they wanna say that they're open till 1 a.m. So what do they do? They write 25 or these guys, they wrote 26 to say that it's open till two o'clock in the morning. Another strange oddity I find there. But everything pales compared to the sheer beauty and their amazing landscaping from Visteria and other plants. And as you walk about and you are supposed to enter somewhere or queue up to stand in line to buy or to sign up or whatever, they give you instructions, please stand in two rows. Even if you are with another person who is not your partner, you don't know them, but everybody stands in line in two rows and it looks orderly and it moves beautifully and there is no confusion whatsoever. This baby seat is available also next to your ATM or whatever it is in the post office, you might have to fill up some forms or pack a package or whatever. Again, a brilliant, brilliant issue. We looked earlier at the food and you know by now, you must have seen it also some places in your country show it. You don't really need to use a menu because everything is displayed in front of you and you go to many small eateries. Some of them have no more than five or six seats and they're busy all day long. In the bigger restaurants where it's sit down, again, you don't need to understand or read the menu. They have a plastic model of the food you consume displayed for your convenience. And what you see is what you get. This is identical, identical. It's so realistic to what you will get. It looks like real food but it's not, everything is made out of plastic and it shows the price. And it really, it is so appetizing. It really wakes and wet your appetite and everything is made of plastic. I think this is hilarious. Another thing they do, uh, because they're also becoming very environmentally conscious and some for some cold dishes, they use these uh, balls which are made out of ice. So as the ice melts, it adds to the broth. So later on, you can drink the whole thing, which a minute ago was the ice cube in which they put the noodles or some other food. Since you like noodles, you like ramen, you like it so much that you can go to a ramen pool. How about that? You sit in a ramen soup pool. You don't really eat the noodles and drink the soup, but you feel it, the sensation of sitting in it. Or some of the wineries offer you a swimming pool where you swim in their wine. Or some of them take you to a tea pool. There is tea pouring into the pool and they say it's very good for you and some people swear by it. So I find it absolutely amazing. Another strange oddity that we could see probably in the West, but not as often as we would see it in Japan. And that will be, how about the sign this gentleman is waving? I'm looking for a bride who will make world peace with me. How about that? Will you marry me? Amazing, amazing stories. Uh, we know all kinds of uh, candies and snack bars and chocolate bars. How about this Kit Kat that comes in over a dozen flavors? I didn't see it in many other countries. Uh, at the most, you have it with milk chocolate, with dark chocolate, maybe a white chocolate, but look at the variety of uh, flavors and, and uh, designs it comes in. I find absolutely hysterical the fact that for Christmas, they go to Kentucky Fried Chicken. It's not a holiday they celebrate. Their way to celebrate it is go to Kentucky Fried Chicken and they book their tables a year in advance from one Christmas to the other. That's how they go about Christmas. On a serious note, even though it's very serious what I've shown, Kentucky Fried Chicken is a serious business there. Look at this red triangle on the windows. You walk in the street and you see 
in, on certain windows, these red triangles, when you're inside the building, you see it also from the inside. In this country where I mentioned earthquakes and tremors and whatever, or just God forbid fire has happened. So this red triangle indicates to you the window where you have to go, the window that will open easily and where the rescue will come. The fire brigade and the first aid and all these emergency services, they know where to come to. In the meantime, how about this young man? He's very busy all the time. For about a hundred dollars, he'll rent himself to you for an hour, whether it's to eat, drink, or just sit next to him. He'll do absolutely nothing. And guess what? He's very busy. For whatever reason, people hire such young people uh, just to sit with them in a coffee shop or talk with them or just keep silent with them. Here is a story. Somebody brought this uh, Hello Kitty logo that uh, used to be very popular advertising different items into a temple. And the people who saw it went quickly across the street and bought more and more of these kittens. And the temple is filled with hundreds, subsequently thousands and thousands of these kittens. So that's their way to express their wish in the temple. If you really like cats and you had, did not have enough in the coffee shop we went to earlier, you can uh, go and take the ferry to an island which has nothing but cats. Or you can go to another island which has nothing but rabbits all over the place. And it's an attraction. Going to the temple, this is a very popular temple, especially for very, very serious business people. To access it, you have to climb these many, many steps. And that shows A, an effort, physical effort, devotion, B, the yearning, the wish to climb up the ladder in your job, in your position, in your status in the office. So I find it absolutely fascinating. Behind everything they do, you scratch a little and there is a reason and everything is in between the very realistic to another realm, which is spiritual, emotional, theological, and the two are intertwined. Talking about theological, again, their sense of uh, amazing aesthetics will position, for example, this pagoda against this beautiful backdrop of the mountain and the waterfall next to it. So it's like they have prepared for you a picture perfect frame to come and witness and enjoy or visit. Talking about artistic ways, not far from Tokyo is one of my favorite museums, is the Hakone, Hakone Open Air Museum, where they have dozens and dozens of incredible masterpieces by some of the leading artists in the world. And inside is a pavilion where these Japanese artists, you can see her name, Toshiko, Oriuchi McAdam, you can see that she married out. She married somebody and she lives in Canada and she goes back and forth. She meets her artwork. She uses a, a needle uh, point and uh, she kind of uh, makes crochets and whatever. And you can actually climb and recline on these masterpieces she creates. Beautiful, beautiful works of art. This is Karl Milles, the Swedish artist. A very famous uh, masterpiece is The Man in the Hand of God and lots of other stuff. Because of the tectonic area, Japan has lots and lots of hot springs. And here you can sit in the middle of the museum. There is a hot spring. You can take your shoes off and put your feet inside. And then for a dollar, you put into uh, like a vending machine and it issues a clean towel, perfectly clean uh, wrapped towel to dry your feet, put your socks and shoes on before you continue to explore the museum. If you look for real serious stuff up in the Japanese Alps, they have these hot springs and they took the natural pools and they incorporated them into the hotels and you share the pool with these monkeys. It's freezing, it's snowing outside. So you sit and the monkeys sit next to you and they behave themselves absolutely perfectly. 
in another town, they have dozens and dozens of these hot springs and baths. Japanese are very, very big on baths. You don't go to the bath to wash. When you enter the bath, you'd better be as clean as possible after you rubbed and scrubbed yourself. But it's a pastime. This town will only let the town people use the bathtubs outdoor. Of course, everybody has the shower and bathtubs indoor as well. They are a few of them in different temperature in each one of them. Now that's an oddity. Here was this small railway line that was not making any profit and they fired people and left hardly anybody. So the station master would be an employee from a nearby store that they'll give him a few pennies, but it was still losing money. And they thought about, okay, let's stop this uh, uh, railroad. It's, this train does not produce any profit. It's costing us fortune. And then somebody had an incredible idea. They took one of the stray cats in the street and they appointed the cat to be the station master. And it became an attraction and people started flowing there and the cat became a national hero, Tama. Everybody knows Tama, the train station. So for the next seven years, she kind of, or it, or whatever you call it, it runs the station. It is the official uh, station master. And when she died or when it died, uh, she was enshrined in the nearby temple. And now the tomb is an attraction. People flock and take the train to pay respect at the tomb of the cat. Can you imagine? So this is Tama. And of course, you can see the train was decorated with the image of Tama. Talking about trains, you must have heard about the Shinkansen, the rapid, the bullet trains, which crisscross the country. They're as comfortable and as convenient as could possibly be. And riding the train, not only do you have all the conveniences with Wi-Fi, of course, and charging uh, USB ports and whatever, nobody says a word. Total silence. The attendants walk up and down through the cars, and each time they enter the car and each time before they leave the car, they bow. Japanese bow. They don't necessarily shake hands. Very rarely with each other, they don't. They will respond to us when we automatically, spontaneously extend our hand for a handshake, but they bow to each other. They created the world record of under seven minutes of turnaround time from the moment the train has arrived at the destination before it turns to go back to wherever it is that they left or to another destination, they'll clean and disinfect and change the head pieces and whatever under seven minutes. Just incredible. And here we are at this amazing train station I mentioned to you earlier. This is the Kyoto train station. Huge, incredible, beautiful on many levels with huge open spaces and huge indoor spaces with all these escalators and eateries and shops inside and music bands, live music and all kinds of sound and light performances. And a few minutes drive, you go to the traditional quarters, the traditional old neighborhoods from centuries ago, where you might see not just some of the people wearing the kimonos, but you might see actually every now and then uh, what you call a geisha. They have different names for different uh, levels of experience and ranks in the geisha world. A beautiful place to be visited in Kyoto is the Golden Temple. Look at the beautiful setup with the water and the rockeries and the trees which are trimmed in a special way. Or you take a walk in this bamboo forest and each time you come to a garden, eventually Japanese gardens do not have flowers other than the cherry blossom, which would take place, of course, but in a traditional uh, Japanese garden, they don't plant bushes with flowers. They have trees, shrub and bush, which is trimmed and cut in special ways. Eventually there will be a bridge. And crossing the bridge is a very important thing because Life is about taking decisions and moving ahead. And each time 
we, okay, now we're going to do this or that. We kind of either cross a hurdle or tackle a hurdle. We take a decision. So it's all about bridges in life. The bridges leading to the temple, sometimes it's only one bridge. Sometimes you go through these long avenues with hundreds of these, these kind of gates, which are called tories. So that's like a gateway that you cross. Another beautiful concept, they've taken Buddhism in some different directions, especially Zen Buddhism. For example, this is a small Zen temple. You go inside and you count 13 stones, 13 rocks. You move to the other side, you still see 13, but you now see stones you didn't see before. And the one stone you saw earlier, you don't see it now. It's a reminder. Life is not always as it seems to be. There might be something else. We should open our mind to all kinds of possibilities. Many of you must have watched the movie. If not, move it to the top of your list, Rashomon. Does it ring a bell, Rashomon? Rashomon is a Japanese movie that tells the same story told by a few people. Each one tells a totally different story, but it's all true. They all witness the event but everybody has a totally different version of it. Amazing, amazing concept. So this is the rockery in the Zen garden. The shogun who used to really rule uh, Japan rather than the emperor lived in this beautiful, beautiful castle, the Yuko castle in uh, Kyoto. They also have a beautiful market, the Nishiki market, very busy and very nice. Traveling a little outside, I'd like to take you to the house of one of my favorite artists anywhere in the world. And this is the master of kimonos. These are not kimonos to be worn. They are huge. They are disproportional to human figure. He uses it as a medium to create traditional Japanese artwork by tie-dye and pulling some strings and pulling some threads. He creates like three-dimensional fabrics, which he creates amazing images. For example, this is a series of Mount Fuji, the way it looks in the fall, in the winter, and in the spring. And it is really, really stunning. I love his work. And now I'd like to take you back into town to visit a place where you go inside and you don't believe yourself. It's a Japanese temple, a Christian temple, but does not resemble a regular church. Everything there is Israel, not only with the Israeli flag, but people who speak Hebrew with you, founded by this gentleman who passed away, as you can see, 18 years ago. I was very privileged to have met him. He was serving as a, as a military chaplain in uh, Manchuria when Japan has occupied the China, parts of China. And in 1937, before the Holocaust, before the birth of the State of Israel, he had a vision saying that they should be a homeland for the Jews built in the land of Israel. He gathered thousands of people around him and he created this amazing organization, huge organization. You go there and they welcome you. They speak to you in Hebrew. And the most amazing is they start singing in Hebrew. They have this amazing choir and they sing in Hebrew. I will ask Adi to send you a, a link to a website, uh, or you can look them up on YouTube yourself. Bet Shalom, they're called. Bet Shalom Kyoto, and you can hear them singing in Hebrew. It's absolutely mesmerizing. It's really, really very special. Uh, another a special group, which are lovers of Israel. They are called the Makuya. You can see the name of the person who has founded it. And they came to Israel and they built a Japanese garden for us in one of the kibbutzim in the Valley of Jezreel. And it is an absolutely fascinating visit to come and take a walk and learn about the principle of Japanese gardens while in Israel. They try to bring every plant and shrub and bush mentioned in the Bible to incorporate it into that park. They come to Israel, and one of the highlights of the visit to Israel to them, other than walking in the street and kissing and hugging Jewish people because they're Israelis, people sometimes don't know what do they want from them. It's amazing. 
they sing Hatikva at the tomb of Theodor Herzl in Jerusalem. So you can imagine there is not a single dry eye in the house. Jewish people have arrived to Japan under very strange circumstances. Maybe one of the most famous one were the Jewish soldiers and officers who were incarcerated as prisoners of war during the Russia-Japan or the Japanese-Russian war. One of them is this very famous person, Joseph Trumpeldor. He was a true leader. And while in the camp, he created a Jewish organization. He published newsletters in Yiddish. They corresponded with people. They took pictures of various groups based on different, these are the rifle carriers and these are the infantry and whatever. Later on, you know him because he came to Israel. He was among the defenders of this small hamlet, Tel Chai, where eight of these defenders died, but by fighting there, they gave us some time to rush supplies and rush help. And that's how the borders of Israel were drawn in the northern part. You see this roaring lion. It's one of the quintessential symbols. Every child in Israel can draw this lion, and it is a story of Joseph Trumpeldor. Back to Japan. They have this amazing fish. They call it fugo. It's the blowfish. To intimidate his enemies, when he feels threatened, he blows himself to make himself much larger. It is a special story. This is the only fish that to impress the male, to impress the female, he can create amazing patterns in the sand on the bottom of the river or the pond or the lake. The Japanese love the meat of this fish, but it's very poisonous. There is a gland that if it is touched and pierced, that's it. Death will come in seconds. And there is no antidote. There are very few people who are licensed and insured to slice and serve this fish. Why am I carrying on about this fish? Because during the 1930s, the Japanese country was not the mighty empire they became later on. They, were, they would remind us of what China used to be 30 odd years ago, creating all kinds of cheap trinkets, very low quality item, but they wanted to be strong. They looked to the West, they looked at Germany, which was making big strides ahead, and they wanted to learn from the Germans how to build a strong economy. But there was something that didn't settle down with them. Here, there is somebody who is the enemy of the Germans, who lives among them. The Jews, they've never seen a Jew in their life. Maybe they've seen the prisoners of war, but that was decades ago, and maybe very few people knew about Jewish people. How on earth will they know more about us? What they figured from the Germans that the Jews, they control the banking, they control the media, they are good at making money at business at the same time, which makes no sense. They are subhumans, they are vermins, they are the enemy of Germany. And somebody had the brilliant idea to import, import, a few tens of thousands of Jews to Japan to help the Japanese rebuild and build their economy. But unlike the Germans, they will make sure to put a curb. The Jews should not take over the Japanese economy. And they named this plan the Fugu plan. Fugu is the name of the blowfish. And they already had all these things ready to operate and they send it to the Japanese embassies and consulates all over the world, which of course it never happened. But one of these copies, one of the, the, uh, the books or booklets or whatever you call it, the documents with the Fugu plan has landed here in the town of Kaunas, which is the capital at that time of Lithuania. Today, Vilnius is the capital. You can see Vilnius an hour and a half away. But at that time, Vilnius was occupied, was part of Poland. And when the Germans occupied Poland, Vilnius was part of Poland. And Kaunas, for the time being, is still an independent country. But the Germans have other plans. After signing the Riventrop-Molotov non-aggression pact, now Germany is going to attack Russia. Jewish refugees from all over are arriving at Kaunas trying to escape. Tomorrow the Germans will be here. What will they do? And 
they are seeking refuge and nobody lets them in or out. There is this very decent Dutch gentleman who lives in Kaunas. He runs the Philips, you know, the Philips, the electronic maker, the radio and recorders and whatever. There is a Dutch plant in Lithuania, in Kaunas, and here's the plight of these Jews. And he has a brilliant idea. He knows that if people apply to travel to the Dutch colony of Curaçao, look where it is, in just north of South America, off the shores of Colombia, Venezuela, and the, the Guyanas. If somebody goes there, they don't need a visa. He goes to the Dutch ambassador in nearby Latvia, and he says, please appoint me to be a consul. We can do something great. And he is, becomes a consul. They create a stamp for him. And can you see that? He's going to issue transit visa. Somebody was seen for a trip to Curaçao. And he has to go by now through Japan. So he contacts this amazing lady who is the first lady who can enjoy this privilege to travel. And together they go to see the amazing Japanese gentleman called Chiyune. Sugihara. Sugihara, born, very easy to remember, January 1st, 1900. His father wanted him to become a doctor. He didn't want to. He failed himself as a doctor because he wanted to study languages and be a diplomat. And he became a diplomat, traveling the world and served in many different positions in Europe, in England, in France, in Germany, in Czech Republic, where he met many, many Jews. And now he sees that he can help these people who cannot go anywhere. They approached him and they said, please give us a visa just to go through Japan. We don't want to be there. Just give us a visa to go through Japan. This is the consulate building. And that's where he started wondering what should he do. He contacted the Japanese government who said, no way, no way. He said, please, we have to help these people. We hear about what happens in the rest of Europe under German occupation. No way. He consulted with his beautiful wife, Yokiko. I was very fortunate to have met her as well. Uh, years ago, she passed away already a few years ago. And he comes to the conclusion that he must do something. And it is at this desk in his office in the consulate seeing all these dozens and dozens of people queuing outside, right outside the gate leading to the consulate, he, issued, started, issue, he started issuing these visas. And these visas were given and saved the life of 3,600 people. Today, on the gates where these people were waiting outside, it says, Visas for Life, Gates of Hope. This is the book which was written by Yokiko, his widow, many years after he passed away. Inside, we can see the travel these people took. You see here they are in Kaunas. They take now from Moscow the Trans-Siberian seven days trip that will get them to Vladivostok, where they will have to cross the Sea of Japan to Tsuruga on their way, supposedly, to go uh, elsewhere. Today, there is the headquarters of the Sugihara Diplomats for Life Foundation, Sugihara House. In his town in Japan, a museum was built. He celebrated in Lithuania because of what he did, memorials to him. He was invited into Israel where he planted a tree in Yad Vashem, our Holocaust Memorial. We call this avenue the Avenue of the Righteous Among the Nations. This is his son when we name and yet another street after him. They even built recently, last year, a memorial in, during COVID next to the hotel. He had to flee for his life because who knows what's going to happen tomorrow. So while in the hotel, he continued issuing the visa. His wife said, Chiune. His nickname was Sempo. We must board the train. We have to leave. On the train, what's your name? Moshe Goldstein. What's your name? Boris Humpelet. What's your name? And then when the train goes faster, he threw 
all the visas and the stamps so they can forge them if they can in an attempt to save them. That's the memorial outside the Hotel Metropole. Even now, we have special relations with the family. This is my friend Shimon. Unfortunately, he passed away a couple of years ago. And when uh, Mr. Sugihara's son heard about it, he said, please wait for me. And he took the plane to come to Lithuania, to the Jewish cemetery in Kaunas, Kovno. This is a special picture, the son of Jan uh, Zwartendijk, the Dutch hero, and the son, another son of Chiyune Sugihara. We reflect on what Sugihara said. He was writing down all his thoughts. How can he say no to all these people? You just have to do it. And that is so amazing, the kind of reflections that he had. One of the men he helped save was Zerach Varavtik. Later on, he was a member in the Israeli parliament and a minister of religious affairs. And this is the two of them meeting during the visit of Sugihara to Jerusalem. It was a very emotional visit, as you can imagine. Uh, and the, one of the groups he saved was the entire Mir Yeshiva students. Dozens and dozens of them were rescued. Unfortunately, they couldn't continue the trip from Japan. The Japanese put them on a boat and sent them to Shanghai, where a ghetto was erected. Can you imagine? There were 23,000 Jews incarcerated in a ghetto in Shanghai, China, but they were not mistreated by the Japanese. Nobody was hurt, nobody was tortured. There was food supply. They were able to work. The trip they had to take across the Trans-Siberian area resulted in the rescue of thousands of them. For many years, uh, Sugihara was shunned by his country. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs, like the State Department in your country, has revoked his degrees and his pension. He ended up being a traveling salesman in Russia for many years until one of the survivors, one of the people he helped rescue, managed to get a job working in Japan for the Israeli embassy. And he was looking for him for many years till he found him. And he said, Mr. Sugihara, you have saved my life. And then he told the story and then he became a hero. Imagine, this is one of the monuments in his honor. This is the Japanese emperor and empress paying respect at the monument to Sugihara. In his town in Japan, a big museum, statues, documents, uh, pamphlets in every conceivable language telling the story of his bravery, a beautiful bell garden, a beautiful fountain outside. Different countries around the world have issued postal stamps. Look, Liberia. The Russian Orthodox Church declared him a saint. He is a saint in the Russian Orthodox Church. This is in Chicago, outside a Starbucks coffee shop. When he visited Israel, he met with the Israeli leadership and we celebrate and sing his praises everywhere. I mentioned we named squares and streets after him. The book made big strides and uh, now he's very, very famous. Another person I'm trying to make a little more famous is another Japanese righteous person, Saburo Nei. He was the Japanese consul in Vladivostok, he had to let them board the boat and go to Japan because without his approval, even though they had a transit visa, they couldn't board the boat. And they managed to get on the boat, all of those thousands of people on the various boats and go to Tsuruga. This is an actual third picture of these Jews who landed in the port of Tsuruga. It's another place where I kind of make, if you want, kind of a pilgrimage to this place because I deem it so incredible. And there is another small museum in the town of Tsuruga. Another Japanese righteous person was a military attache in the Japanese embassy in Russia before um, the things changed and Russia started fighting, of course, with Japan. And he issued visas. This was the first lady who was given an Isha, a visa, Richelle Kotler, and she also survived thanks to him. The few Jews who managed to get to Japan after the long trip and expenses 
didn't have much money, and here is this incredible Japanese person who starts walking around in the streets. Japan is already at war. People are suffering and struggling and starving, and he collected money and food for the Jewish refugees. Later on, he converted to Judaism, and we celebrate him to date. An incredible person. Like all converts, his first name should be Abraham, so he's Abraham Kotsuji. We sing, as I said, his praises, and we think this is a story that has to be told. And this is something that Japanese emphasize and tell these stories. There is a Jewish community in Japan today. They are mostly expats, but we have also Japanese in Israel. How about this young man who wanted to study the Jewish language? He didn't know, but he studied Yiddish. He thought he was studying Hebrew, but he studied Yiddish. And he became one of the leading Yiddishists in the world. Can you imagine? He now teaches Yiddish in the Bar Ilan University in Israel, which is university meant mostly for Orthodox Jews, not only, but he teaches Jewish people the Yiddish language. In Japan, they have many Yiddish clubs. Look at that. They publish newsletters. They have dictionaries. They put bulletins, and it is some story translating lots of Japanese novels and poetry and haiku, you know, the five liners into the Yiddish language. Sorry, I took a little longer, but that will bring our trip into conclusion. Thank you for joining us. I tried to show something which was a little different not necessarily on all your, as I said, special TV programs, but I hope you enjoyed it. I'll stop sharing now. And if anybody has a question, I'll gladly answer your questions. Adi, will you please, Adi, will you please uh, narrate? Of course. Thank you, Jacob. It was amazing. I think that a lot of us um, got to experience and see something new and learn new things. I, I personally never visit Japan, but now I kind of want to go there. <laughs> That's what happened after um, hearing you explaining all of this. So thank you. I did give Steve a lot of commenting how wonderful it was and um, that they learn a lot. I do have a couple of questions. So let's start with the toilet at the beginning. Um, we got a comment that they recognize the Western style toilet. Has this become more regular? Oh, yes. So invariably, Invariably, wherever you go, sorry for, again for discussing these graphic details, but wherever you go to the facilities, uh, you will find for some of the Japanese people who still prefer it, you will find uh, the traditional, you know, uh, Japanese toilet, but next to them, there will be Western style everywhere. Everywhere there will be Western style, not only Western style, they will all have the Toto seat. Again, sorry for the graphic details, but that is the seat that has the facilities to wash and dry. <laughs> and it's, it's everywhere, even in the most remote service area, in a gas station, you'll step inside and you will see this amazing Toto seat with the hot water and the hot air and whatever, everywhere. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, where is the largest Jewish community in Japan? So Tokyo will have the largest. There will be mostly expats who are there for business. Some of them married local Japanese people, men and women who married local Japanese people. Lots and lots of uh, uh, students are there, people who work for the consulates or embassies or diplomatic missions for the airlines, shipping companies, banks, high tech. So the largest will be in Japan large enough for the Chabad to set shop, of course, and offer kosher food and whatever, and large enough for some people to open uh, Israeli uh, restaurants with falafel and hummus, which are making big strides, and Japanese are learning to discover it, and the Japanese are now learning to love shakshuka. Oh my goodness, they think shakshuka is the greatest invention since sliced bread. There is another small one in Kyoto and a few more smaller Jewish communities in other towns and cities in Japan. Is there still a Jewish community in Kobe? 
Yes, there is still a Jewish community in Kobe. Kobe, the Jewish community was uh, started in the 30s by a young couple from Aleppo, Syria. It was uh, very common in the 19th century, they most, mostly the Baghdad Jews, the Iraqi Jews who sent young people to set shop, to open some kind of offices and, 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 and purchasing agencies in China, in India, in Indonesia, in Singapore. And in the 30s, a young couple came from Kobe, uh, from Aleppo to Kobe, and that was the beginning of the uh, Jewish community there. Unfortunately, Kobe was devastated by a big earthquake, which has devastated one of the most beautiful collections of uh, Japanese art, beautiful uh, porcelain and pottery and glassware that were collected by this special lady, the, the Jewish lady born in Syria who became a top expert and an avid collector of Japanese art. Thank you. What time of year did you say that it's best to visit beside the fall? As I said, I started by saying anytime you go, you'll find, because it's a huge country, it spreads over thousands of miles. So when it might rain and snow in the north, it's going to be warm and lovely in Okinawa, in the south, in a tropical climate. So every month. But to visit the central island, which we have visited, I highly recommend mostly two seasons. Go there in October for the fall foliage or go late March, early April for the cherry blossom. Oh yeah, the cherry blossom, it's incredible. It is really, uh, you know, sometimes I'm sorry to admit, I apologize to the people I travel with. I said, I'm gonna scream now and I scream. It's so beautiful. It's so mind boggling, I scream. <laughs> um, so do you, have, do you plan to have a tour there in person? People are asking. So right now, Japan, until further notice, is still closed for foreigners. It was closed even for Japanese people. Can you imagine trying to come home for the longest time? But hopefully they will open in, uh, in October or November. So if we might miss the fall foliage season, one should certainly count on planning to go there during the cherry blossom, the Sakura season. I do lead tours and I cannot wait for people to join me on this tour. We have tours going to Morocco, to many sites. I only lead now tours with Jewish content. I mean, I love many different places around the world, but right now my big passion is going on to Jewish history and, and Jewish themes and special relations with Israel and the Jewish people. So those of you who wish to travel, I don't have a website, I don't advertise really, but uh, you, saw my, uh, you saw my email address or Adi can share it with you. Adi, can you please share it of on the course. chat? I, I shared it all over the conversation with, with people perfect, who asked perfect. and I'll put it now in the chat. Thank you. So you can drop me a line and I'll add you to the a mailing list, so if I have a tour, an English-speaking tour uh, coming up, whether it's to Egypt or Morocco or Tunisia, which is now becoming a big, big destination, everybody should consider. It's a fantastic story and a Jewish story to boot. Right now, I'm not going to Ukraine as much as I would have loved to. I think some of you have joined us months ago. Adi, I think we ran Ukraine yes, following the Jewish bookshelf. Yes. Um, okay. So right now, of course, we don't go to Ukraine and I will not go to Moldova and Transnistria, but hopefully we'll be able to, to resume these trips because of the very rich and fascinating Jewish history in all of these countries. I hope. Wonderful. Thank you, Jacob, for everything. We learned so much. We received so many wonderful comments about this uh, tour and you know people who already know a lot but they discovered so much more um with your tour here today so thank you so much for being with us once again and thank you all for coming and and supporting us to do this whole um we are running by the end of june and then we'll take a, 
a short summer break and we'll get back for uh, for another year of ritual events. So if you want to help us, um, you can just donate us through the uh, fundraiser event that we're having next month. And please, if you have any questions for the, tr uh, for the trip to Israel, just email me and we'll see you in Israel. <laughs> Thank you, and I hope you join us in Israel and on more of these meetings. Thank everybody for your kind words, and I wish everybody enjoy the rest of the day. Have a wonderful week and wonderful month and wonderful year, and shalom to you all. Shalom. Shalom. Bye-bye.